Were there women in the Mexican muralist movement or was it an exclusive boys club? The answer is more complex than you think. Picture Mexico in the 1920s. The revolution had ended, leaving behind the economy on the ground and a divided Mexico that was ready to start anew. After all, the revolution was not just a noble battle against the Porfiriato, but a decade of violence, hunger and chaos. The initial goal of overthrowing Porfirio Diaz's right-wing dictatorship quickly escalated into a civil war with various groups fighting for labor rights, land ownership and a clash of socialist, capitalist and anarchist ideologies. Art got political. For example, the former director of the Academy of Fine Arts, Gerardo Murillo, joined forces with the constitutionalists, rallying workers and future muralists like David Alfaro Siqueiros and Jose Clemente Orozco to their cause against the farmers, led by the famous Emiliano Zapata and Pancho Villa. In the end, the constitutionalists emerged victorious and were given the colossal task of rebuilding a divided nation and consolidating the identity of their new revolutionary state. In President Álvaro Obregón's mind, who better than the philosopher and intellectual José Vasconcelos to construct this new idea? Vasconcelos was already concocting his designs for Universopolis, a utopic place ruled by culture and art, led by Mexican mestizos, his famous cosmic race. His extraordinary vision elevated the power of the arts to educate the public and transform society, so it was up to the artists themselves to help construct this fantastic nation. What better way to create the new post-revolutionary state, right? Therefore, in his charge, he would have the funds to hire the best artists of his generation that, for him, of course, were all men, as most of the students of the academy were, and start to portray this enlightening world in the walls of the schools and government buildings so the general and mostly illiterate public could learn and become the cornerstones of his magnanimous vision. Although he initially hired artists like Dr. Atler, Roberto Montenegro, Gabriel Fernández Ledesma, and Jorge Enciso, the great three muralists, Diego Rivera, David Alfaro Siqueiros, and José Clemente Orozco, were the ones who truly embraced this cosmic dream, mixing his intellectual Greek and medieval idols with Mexican popular culture. What is interesting is that although Vasconcelos was open to the power of female participation in his new utopic nation, even inviting the Chilean poet and educator Gabriela Mistral to collaborate in his extensive educational reformation. For him, as was the case of many of the cultural trailblazers of the time, the revolution always preceded any form of gender struggle. He probably didn't even consider hiring female artists, least of all thinking whether or not this was right or wrong, as his view was to partner with the most renowned artists of the academy to achieve his objective. Yet, as wonderful as it could have been, Mexico was far from the utopia Vasconcelos was building. Even his group of artists became more political, establishing the movement as a syndicate with a clear Marxist agenda. For them, the revolution had a particular purpose, to build a communist state, with the workers, and therefore themselves, as they view themselves, not as ordinary artists, but as part of the proletariat, in control. However, the government had, of course, very different ideas. After all, the revolution meant something else to every one of their actors. So when the artists started slashing the administration in their new magazine, El Machete, they were forced to choose between canceling their publication or losing their mural commissions. For this reason, the famous three split up each defending a different side of the fight, ending the initial movement conceived by Vasconcelos. But Mexican muralism did not end there. The Mexican government was far from foolish and understood the propaganda power they held in their hands. 
So their vision rapidly evolved from a Hellenistic desire for public progress to create a national identity that would highlight a single definition of the revolution and justify the legitimacy of the newly formed political party Partido Nacional Revolucionario. This man rewriting history as if the sole battle had been against a foreign capitalist regime represented by Diaz's government, and why not the Catholic Church, and pretending that all the revolutionary factions had fought for the exact socialist cause. As Rivera was the one who decided to remain under the government's payroll, it was his brush who helped build this desire revolution, celebrating the worker, the farmer, and the pure indigenous pre-colonial man. This decision was not random. During the presidency of Plutarco Elias Calles, Catholic leaders had revolted against the administration to fight for political and educational participation. Therefore, what better way to convince the public of the government's cause than to associate Catholicism with the shackles of colonialism and not only believe that the Mexican public was no longer Catholic, but that pure indigenous culture and race was still existed and was the basis of this new national identity. The new idol served the government to consolidate their recent land reforms and industrial development projects and highlight the political legitimacy of the new secular state. This is when women entered the picture. During the end of the 1920s, more women were admitted to the Academy of Fine Arts and to the Communist Party, allowing them to increase their role and contribution. So, as more mural commissions escalated in round two of Mexican muralism, more women were allowed to participate. Initially, they started as assistants, like Isabel Villaseñor with the mural of Alfredo Salce in 1929. Then former Academy graduates like Aurora Reyes and even American artists like Marion and Grace Greenwood and Eleanor Cohen who had fallen in love with the movement through the Mexican Folkways magazine were given mural commissions. However, as you can see, their number remain very limited. It is essential to understand that this movement, unlike any other art movement in the world, apart from Russia, remain attached to governmental control and most importantly, limited state funds. Despite how open-minded artists wanted to be, they all fought for the limited spaces and commissions given by established institutions and most of them preferred to hire renowned male artists instead of what they considered up-and-coming female artists. Let's look, for example, at what happened to the artist Maria Izquierdo. In 1945, after a few years of escalated national and international recognition that she worked really hard to achieve, she received finally a 200 square meter mural commission at the federal government's headquarters. What a massive opportunity, right? However, just as she was about to begin the project, having acquired all the materials and hired her assistants, the commission was abruptly cancelled. According to her, this decision resulted from a boycott led by the famous muralist Rivera, Siqueiros and Orozco, who questioned her technical abilities to complete the project, in her mind due to the fact of her being a woman. She responded by launching a public war through the press, challenging the muralist monopoly and blaming them for her downfall. This controversy, unfortunately, ignited public scrutiny over the entire mural commission, particularly during a tense economic period in the country, leading to doubts regarding her artistic abilities and her value as an artist. As we can see in the end, Mexican muralism as a movement was primarily a boys club. Once it stopped behaving like a movement and became more of a commercial and artistic tool for multiple political, industrial and cultural institutions, it began expanding its scope. More artists like Lola Álvarez Bravo, Electa Arenal, Lilia Carrillo, Elena Huerta, Olga Costa, Nadine Prado, and foreign artists like Leonora Carrington, Valeta Swan, Rina Lasso, Fanny Ravel, were given the chance to contribute their vision to Mexican walls. But the question remains, did women truly get an equal share in shaping Mexico's muralist legacy, or were they just a colorful backdrop in a larger political canvas? You tell me. 
If you want to learn more about the fantastic female artists we discussed during this video, don't forget to check Amalgama Academy's new course, Great Artists from Latin America. For more information, you can check the link we attach in this video. Thank you.